Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to our community advocacy training. Uh, my name is Aubrey Molinetto. I am the Water Justice Coordinator for the Mercer County and Trenton vicinity. I work with Clean Water Action and with the Clean Water Fund. Present today, um, we have Fred Stein, our Citizen Action Coordinator for the Delaware River Keeper Network. Uh, and another one of our presenters is Lorraine Prince, our Environmental Watchdog. She's with Newton Creek Watershed Association. So welcome and thank you for uh, your participation on this evening. In the back scenes, we have Eric Benson, who is our tech for tonight, and he will be assisting us with Q&A and with also our presentations. Um, so thank you all again for joining us. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of the screen in more where it has the three dots. Or if you, can, if you can't figure that out, then you can put them in the chat as well. Eric will be monitoring them and he will be speaking, uh, speaking them to us and we will answer at the end of all of the presentations. So without further ado, I'd like to present Fred and Lorraine with their presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Aubrey. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, as Aubrey said, my name is Fred Stein. I'm a citizen action coordinator, a community organizer with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And I've been there for about 26 years. And I'll be talking about, with Lorraine's help, uh, we'll be talking about the Open Public Records Act, how to gather public information uh, from different government sources that helps us become better advocates for our waterways. Of course, we're speaking about the waterways, but this you, you'll hear tonight that there's um, uh, opportunity to get information from your Department of Health, from your school board, from your town, to take to, to look at information that the government has available uh, and is, is accessible to us um, for a variety of, of reasons, not just environmental advocacy, although that is quite the, the most important one anyway. But uh, um, I'd like to, I'm going to start sharing my screen um, and um, and uh, take you through the, the presentation. Here we go. Great, great. Um, I'd like, uh, Lorraine, would you mind giving yourself a, a, a present, uh, an introduction also? Oh, sure. Hi, folks. I'm, uh, I'm actually a mentee of FRED. Um, uh, I call myself an environmental watchdog, and my, the main organization that I uh, work with is the Newton Creek Watershed Association. I am also uh, uh, the stormwater uh I guess, advocate or stormwater management advocate for the Tri-County Sustainability uh, Organization, which uh, encompasses uh, a lot of South Jersey. A lot of uh, counties and towns are a part of that. We keep our eyes on water. But of course, we're not gonna just be talking about water. We're gonna be talking about community advocacy. So uh, a lot of what I've learned, um, Fred put me onto the path of it. And I've I used a lot of uh, some of his knowledge uh, to come up with um, uh, some of the solutions and, and uh, issues that I've been following. So thanks, Fred. You're welcome. So um, what we're going to be sharing tonight is just uh, an introduction of how to do an OPRA request, Open Public Records Act request for this information. There's uh, so much more to learn about this, and you'll, a lot of it, it you learn as you go along. Um, but what we'll be talking about is how to do an OPRA, how to get a block and lot um, from using some online mappings. And this is just very basic digital or online mapping, how to research local ordinances, and then um, how to get um, um, federal information. OPRA is a state, a state entity, and I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. But how do you go to the federal government and get get information from the EPA, from the Delaware River Basin Commission and other groups. Uh, and I'll share that, I'll share that along the way. And 
So as I said, this is um, an introduction to uh, the Open Public Records Act and, and OPRA, it just governs the access to the government records in the state of New Jersey. And um, again, like I said, it's a starter. It's a starter course. Um, government records, what, what they consider government records um, is this, whole, this long list of information that's accessible to you. And it can be accessible at your municipality um, or the state agency, DEP, Department of Health, DCA, other, organ, other entities. Um, and it includes paper documents, written documents, this whole list, photographs, plans, um, and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, whether you're looking to do um, investigating about clean water um, in, your, in, your, in your drinking water supply or the scrapyard down at the end of the street, if you're interested in finding more information about what, what's going on between your state agency or your municipality and that property owner, it's going through this public records, this OPRA request process that we're talking about tonight. And as I said, I mean, the, the, um, the highest level of the state in New Jersey and the legislature are all subject to OPRA. But what, what I found in, in my day-to-day -day work with um, environmental advocacy, a lot of it has to do with working and getting that information directly from the municipalities, from the planning and zoning boards uh, and county agencies. And that's, you know, maybe that's where you will be uh, getting a lot of the information or seeking a lot of the information too. Um, the, in, the most important information or the most important um, information, yeah, information that I can share with you tonight is the uh, information that's on the screen now, a citizen's guide to open public records act. This has all the information that I'm, a lot of the information, the how to's, um, that I'm sharing tonight. Um, and it, um, the, you can see from the web link here, this information is available online. Uh, you can get a printed form uh, to, give, to give you this 30 page document that helps you through uh, the, the rules and regulations of an OPRA, an, of an OPRA request. Um, I also found I called them over over my years. I've called them when I had a question that wasn't clear in that citizens guide, and they helped me through there. So the phone number there. These guys are these uh, the the government records council is a is a great resource for you as you as you want to advance. And if you don't, you know. Um, as you as you think about doing an OPA request in a month or six months or a year, you can go back to this uh, resource. So the, 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 the first step in getting a, an OPA request, as I said, is, um, is to identify a property that you're interested in. Um, you you want to go in and you want to have the block and lot number. Every parcel, your house, your property has a block and lot number. The scrapyard down the street has a block and lot number. What we found is the Newton Creek, New, Newton Creek Park in Collingswood. We were getting ready for this and Lorraine asked, you know, does the Newton Creek Park have a block and lot? And we found out that it does. And it's a relatively easy process to, to get your block and lot by going to New Jersey DEP's website and you can see the image on the screen now. This is, a, this is what you'd see if you went into um, New Jersey DEP GeoWeb. Um, and it takes you directly to um, this interface where you, you push the button in the, in the bottom of the screen and it says Launch GeoWeb. Um, you, you, you see this next screen on your right and you just hit OK. And this takes you directly to um, the, the screen that you'll see in the lower right-hand corner where you can see properties all have um, an individual block and lot. And this is important. So when you do submit your OPA request, you know, the, the application, whether it's written form or, or uh, fill in the blank uh, online form, it helps positively identify the parcel. 
And um, I'm sorry, I think I jumped ahead. The, 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 um, the other piece of information that is valuable in addition to block and lot is the address of the property. And of course, and if it's, you know, the, um, the house three doors away that may have a, a leaking oil tank or something, you pretty much know that, that eat that address. But if what I do is just use Google maps, uh, which we probably most all, everyone knows fairly familiar with, but you get the, the, the mailing address or the address from that piece of part that that piece of property and what I was interested in learning more about is in the city of Trenton uh, a, a large piece of property uh, along the Assen Pink Creek that would seem to me would be ideal for flood mitigation how do we prevent flooding in Trenton uh, from being uh, reduced and, and one way is to reconnect the floodplain so I was looking at uh, Google Maps and looking at the, the way the Aspen Pink flows through the town. And I noticed this piece of property, large piece of property next to George Page Park, uh, right on North Clinton and Nottingham Way. So it gives me the address. I'm able to take that address and go into geo, the, the New Jersey Geo Web and just put in the address in the search. I put in 27 Nottingham Way, Trenton, New Jersey, and it brings up it brings up the um, the GeoWeb map that shows the the block and lot in the lower right hand corner, and you can see that 27 Nottingham Way has a block uh, 22101 lot number two, and from this information, you can then go to um, you can go then go to either New Jersey DEP or the City of Trenton. Uh, and identify that property in their OPA request format. So um, I wanted to, I, I purposefully went to Trenton um, to show, to demonstrate how um, it's not only New Jersey DEP that you might want to get information, say, on this piece, particular piece of property or on a, on a similar piece of property. Um, so this is an example of what you would see if you went to Trenton. And here you can see um, in Trenton, it has um, the, the button, the electronic button you can push on the right-hand side of the screen, file open public request uh, electronically here. And um, here you, you open up the, you, you follow that prompt and you go to Trenton's online uh, OPA request form and fill it out. And you see that this is pretty self-explanatory. And um, if you look down um, where my the blue arrow is um, on this screen, you can see where I typed in what information I was looking for, what record I was requesting. And, um, and then you can see, please provide any and all information pertaining to 27 Nottingham Way. And I put the block and lot in there. And I give a specific period of time um, because you you know if you ask for all information for all time it may be seen as too broad and that's one reason that in an OPA request your your request can be denied if the information you're asking for is just too broad so I give a specific period of time that I'm looking for um, in this in this case and of course if you find that you get a volume of information and some of the information you want for an earlier period of time, you just would file a second OPA request and ask for an earlier period of time. Uh, many times though, I'd find where um, they just say, come in and take a look at these files and we'll bring all 27 boxes and you can look at whatever you wanna look at. Um, but you do wanna give um, a period of time. And below that, you can see I list a series of a series of documents of what I'm specifically looking for. And in this case, um, I'm thinking that a large piece of property like that in Trenton might have some contamination on it. So I ask for site remediation. I ask for any environmental impact statements that have been made, any development applications, and you just put that list that information there because you want to give some ask for some specific information 
um, that would give you the information um, that would help you investigate or learn more about that particular piece of property. So that was that was Trenton um, in New for New Jersey DEP. A lot of the a lot of the OPA requests that we submit for um, that I submit for with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network is through New Jersey DEP. And New Jersey DEP, you would just go you the image on the uh, upper left. You can see that. Um, um, you can see where we had where you go to the public records Oprah request on DEP and it takes you over to, um, you know, to your next interface where it submitted an Oprah request online. And, um, and so you're just following this step by step process. And I know that there, there, there have been instances, I think Lorraine has one where where you apply, you submit in from, you submit a request for to a municipality, and you don't get the information you're looking for. Is it? Did you have a, you had an example of that, didn't you, Lorraine? Um, yeah, um, um, I I was requesting information from my town, and since my town doesn't have, well, my town does have. Um, they, they do keep records and most towns should be keeping records, but when I asked them for them using um, a, a, a different URL, which I'll share with you in a second, um, I asked them to uh, give me this particular document, document and they told me they didn't have it. Um, but I happen to know that uh, the New, York, New Jersey DEP requires um, all towns to submit this document to the DEP. So I wound up uh, then contacting the DEP to ask for that record. Um, there's, uh, there's other ways of remediating when a town doesn't uh, actually uh, want to share or cannot share or doesn't have the document. Um, if you go to this link that I'm going to share with you, it's an it's a, it's a independent um, way of, of submitting an OPA request uh, as opposed to what Fred's been showing you, which is uh, specific links on specific websites that uh, will get you an OPA request from a, a specific in organization. But if you're looking for an organization that doesn't give you links like my municipality didn't, you would use this link I'm, go I'm going to give you. Um, so yeah, so that's my story of, uh, of getting something from my town when they said to me they didn't have it. I'll put the link right now in the, uh, in the thing to show you what I used. So yeah, so the, I think the point is is that uh, some information. You, sometimes you have to be a little bit of a a detective in your in your searching, you know. And it could be it could be if the town doesn't have it, the state does, or if the state doesn't have it, maybe the county has it. Uh, there's an example um, in our work with Riverkeeper where we had been trying to get. Um, uh, groundwater contamination information from a company down in Gloucester, Gloucester County for years, and they wouldn't release it and, uh, because it was proprietary. Um, and the, the state agency wouldn't release it either. Um, but when we were doing some another OPRA on the deepening of the Delaware, of the dredging of the Delaware, in that file, we found the same, we found the documents we had been looking for uh, for years. And so sometimes you have to be a little bit uh, of a sleuth um, and, and, um, and look, look how to get to where the information that you're looking for uh, maybe through a different source. So continuing, continuing with the New Jersey DEP OPRA request, this is D, DEP is all online. You can submit it in writing if you if you if you want. You can see in the upper right hand corner of this um, if um, you can submit a uh, a request and, and print out a form and submit it in writing. And of course, in each of these, even with an online, if you're not comfortable with doing it online, um, you can get a written you can get a hard copy uh, paper and 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 send it send it off that way too this is just uh you know just faster because it's electronic obviously so 
leaving the, the DEP as an example, and again, I, I know I, I'm covering a lot of information and, and maybe somewhat superficially, but this is just an introduction to how you can go about and get this, get this information from the state agencies or the uh, executive branch. And, and um, the next series of slides is talking about how to go to your municipality and get this information. And the one thing that Lorraine was uh, making, wanting to make sure that we stressed is before you submit a, an OPRA request um, and go through that process, um, you want to check you know, the the, your, your town's municipal site uh, because a lot of the information that you think you need to submit an OPRA request on might already be um, online. And, and Lorraine, could you share with this is this is from again this is from Collingswood, right? Your town. Yeah, this is yeah this is from my town. Okay, so what you're looking at is a web page from my town's website, Collingswoods, and um, it, they have a, a web page called the Document Center, and they put a, they, the, the things that they put on on this page are um, anything. If you take a look at the little white square and this gray background on that page, it's uh, it shows you like uh, if the commissioners, uh, historic commission, the planning board, or the zoning board has any official documents. This is where they're going. They're supposed to store them. It, it, it's usually only as good as the clerk who is actually uploading these things. But for some reason, my town is pretty good. Uh, I had a, a, a project where I was trying to find out how much impervious cover was uh, was being allowed by our zoning board. They were uh, going well above the zoned recommendations when they were uh, approving variances. And of course, uh, this happens in like little fits and starts. People don't necessarily, even on the zoning board, know how much they're letting happen. So I thought it was important to let them know that they are really uh, overdoing it with allowing people to cover up parts of their property. So I, uh, if you see at the bottom there, it's got some white rectangles with uh, addresses. My town happens to put their, um, uh, the resolutions where they allow for variances on the web pages. So I was able to go to my uh, my municipal website and get this information. When I tried to do were some other websites uh, that were neighboring to my town. Those those towns did not uh, did not put it on their websites. I could not find this kind of information on other towns' websites. There's no law that says they have to do this. Um, so I um, I had a choice. I could. Um, I could I could go to the town clerk there and ask, or it was much easier for me to use that uh, that I just that link that I put in the chat window called Oprah Machine, where I could just actually ask um, uh, them to provide me with the information. Fred, do I have a minute or two to just mention uh, what what makes this Oprah Machine um, link pretty cool? Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. So. Um, you don't have to, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm an environmentalist. Uh, that's mostly what I'm asking about, but there's all kinds of things you can get from, from uh, public organizations using the OPRA uh, system. Um, and this particular URL that I provided, the one called OPRA Machine, it's very nice because when you go first go there, you actually get uh, a choice of the different um, organizations in the state that you want to make a request from. It goes everywhere from the governor's office down to your municipal townships, uh, DPW department, if you wanted to. And if, and if it happens to be included in that that drop down link, you would check it. So I would just go and I find the local towns. Um, uh, say commissioner board, and then I would type in my request pretty much like Fred showed you in, in previous things. And the part that's really cool about it is that it lets you know by mail when you get a response. And if you don't get a response, you're allowed to click off little things that tell you uh, it's either waiting or it's uh, it's it's uh, it's not going to be given to you. And there's even a, 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 a something you can click that'll let you um, take it to a higher level as to um, uh, questioning why they don't do it. Um, and I like it particularly because it keeps track of all the requests I've ever made to Oprah. So anyway, the point of this whole thing is first go to your website for your town or the town that you're checking out and see what they have. If they don't have it, then you can make an OPA request. You could use that link I used or you could walk in the front door of the place and go to their clerk or whoever handles their documents and ask to see it. That's it, Fred. That's good. And that's if you're the, uh, the Marine princes of the world who file many, many OPA requests every month. So it's good to have that to help you organize and, and uh, stay, um, stay organized, yeah. And the, uh, so the other, we, 
we want to just go to um, uh, uh, Lorraine mentioned that she was interested in the impervious coverage uh, re allowable uh, rates uh, in her town. And so um, part of one another uh, available um, way to find that information out is through your municipal ordinances. And um, again, um, before you file an OPA request, um, you know, you want to check out your municipal uh, website. And, and here you'll find that if you go to your town, head and township, and this is this is my town, before you file an OPA request, you can um, you go to your ordinances, and this will give you everything from uh, impervious coverages and stormwater and mitigation, um, illegal dumping, um, all, all sorts of information. Obviously, the full range of what each municipality's ordinances have to cover. Um, and what um, what this where you'll go here, you won't go actually to a um, an OPA request. What that what this does, Haddon Township and 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 I believe most towns in the state of New Jersey um, have farmed this program out to um, or farmed keeping track of the library of their ordinances through a website. In the next slide, it'll show you the. Um, the link to that, um, the web link to where you go on that. But this is where you would, again, looking for public information available to you, not only through Oprah, but through this, uh, these ordinances. And this is an example of how it takes you to Hamilton, or to Haddon Township, and look up information that is relevant to you that you might want to learn more about. Uh, and I just highlighted impervious coverage. So you go to um, you go to the your your town's website. You look under ordinances, and it'll direct you to this this website. And oh, it takes you um, it takes you to a um, the website. I um, could uh, I think that it uh, was supposed to go up in on this slide was the um, ECODE 360. Lorraine, could you put that in the chat? Yes, I will, Fred. Sorry. And the example Sorry I put that. in was for Trenton. But you can you can look it up for any town. It's uh, uh it's it's fairly easy to do if you uh, if you just Google e360.com, you will uh, probably uh, get to a, 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 a uh, a start page that lets you then select whatever town you'd like to look at to see what their laws and ordinances yep. are. And again, this is information available to you that uh, is 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 online. It's not necessary. It's not uh, necessarily Oprah, but it is available to you online and helps you do your sleuthing or your um, uh, your your work in in checking out what's going on in your particular community just a little closer. Yeah, Fred, if, if you don't mind, a, a good, I can go back to my example when I was in, uh, investigating impervious cover in my town. Um, I was able to, uh, before I even um, submitted the OPA request, I did go to the website uh, for my town and I did see all those documents that they keep uh, as a record of uh, what they've allowed um, uh, as variances for the town. Um, so I had all that information in front of me so that when I made my OPA request, I was able to very, very, I was very clear about what it is I wanted. I knew, I knew what to ask for because I had already checked it all out in our municipal code. All right, for thanks. instance, I, I knew, I knew how much um, impervious surface uh, different zoning areas were allowed to have and not have. So that's, I knew that ahead of time before I started investigating. So that was very helpful to me. That is, that is helpful going into your planning or zoning board already showing that you have a little bit of information uh, available that that um, and it helps you know get them to take you more seriously would you say that's true yep, def oh definitely a credibility is, is important when asking any question so uh, and now the, the final the final topic that we wanted to cover uh, in, in, on this uh, training video is um, is how do you how do you get information from a federal source? And um, Oprah is is state is the state of New Jersey. Um, Pennsylvania has a similar program it's called Right to Know. 
Uh, but under the federal, uh, under if you're looking for information from US EPA or the Delaware River Basin Commission or the Army Corps of Engineers, um, you would get a Freedom of Information Act request, which is the same idea as an OPRA request. Um, uh, but a FOIA is what is what you would want to do for each of these different agencies. And I just go over quickly what um, you know what the interface with these different agencies look like. And here, of course, is is EPA, and EPA covers a lot of the um, the the uh, national the, the the federal regulations that govern the, what the state of New Jersey and other other states do the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act and so Safe Drinking Water Act and that sort of thing pollution um, the pollution um, discharge elimination system but in in with EPA you would go again right onto the EPA's website and you can do a, a FOIA uh, with an electronic fill in the blank request form as you see on the lower right similar to what some of the uh, similar what to what New Jersey DEP is and some of the other entities that we pointed out earlier in the presentation it's you fill in that you fill in the blank and you can you fill in the form and submit a request for information under a FOIA request and you can see the EPA uh, gov forward slash FOIA uh, link there in the lower left of this of the uh, of the of the screen. So and it takes you through the process, just like the OPA request does. And DRBC, um, DRBC is, is similar. And you can see DRBC has uh, an interactive um, um, fillable uh, online screen uh, that you would you would complete there. And, and, you know, the Delaware River Basin Commission, I mean, they have a, they, they, they do a lot of things, a lot of regulatory um, oversight on the on the flow of the bait of the Delaware River uh, itself and water water withdrawals from groundwaters from everything from your municipality to your to a, go a golf course you know if you want to take in more water you have to get DRBC uh, 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 approval on that sort of thing so some of the inquiries that you make on an issue that's impacting your community might be through the DRBC um, and so this just is a, is a way to show you that you go onto their website and it's it's again it's a fairly straightforward of filling in the uh, online web uh, web form and then the final is the uh, Army Corps of Engineers um, and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, does a lot of work throughout the state that have an impact on uh, on each of our little municipalities even in the Ashen Pink Creek. Uh, watershed where that flows through Trenton, um, but the Army Corps of Engineers has been involved with um, ecosystems, uh, an ecosystem project in the city of Trenton where they daylighted uh, a large section of the Assunpink Creek right in downtown Trenton, and they conducted and and conduct all over the state, but in in um, in the Assunpink Creek it was a flood mitigation. Uh, assessment because the acid pink flood so so frequently. So the Army Corps of Engineers um, even you know does have projects and um, is engaged in um, rivers issues throughout the state. So it might be something that you find uh, may be a source of information for an issue that you're working on. And the images that I have here, I think that the one the thing that you is most telling is the Army Corps of Engineers, and I circled it down below, is that they are, their, their, their requests aren't electronic, but they're looking for them in writing. So um, when you go to their Freedom of Information Act, that process um, is a little bit old school, but it's, a, but it's in writing, but um, it's still there all the same. So I think that that is, that's my last slide. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to uh, come conclude that that uh, I hope it's a very um, very introductory level on how to do Oprah, but I think it shows you that there is a lot of information out there, more or less at your fingertips, um, and um, I hope that that helps you do uh, your watchdogging and watching, keeping track of the uh, your community and your waterways. Um, 
Great. Uh, uh, thank, th Fred, uh, thank you so much. Um, and also, if uh, Lorraine, you want to copy and paste Fred's, uh, you know, contact information, put that into the chart uh, the chat because it's hard to copy and paste from presentations. I have a couple of short questions uh, before we go back to um, uh, the rest of our, our presentations here. A uh, question for Fred and Lorraine: Does it make sense to go to the municipal clerk first to ask for questions, uh, documents, or is it better to start with an, the formal OPA requests? I think it's better to go. It's better to go and do a formal OPA request because if you go to the clerk and the clerk says that, oh yeah, I can take care of that if you come back tomorrow or whatever, you don't have the you don't have the regulatory. Um, backup that a formal OPA request will provide because once you submit an OPA request, uh, the, the town clerk has a certain number of days, seven business days, to get that information to you. If they can't get it to you because it's broad or they have to go and research it in their files, they can they have to add they have to ask you for an extension and that sort of thing. I think it's much better to um, to ask for um, you know go through the formal process. Okay, great. And then uh, people were wondering, if it, are there fees for these requests? There, there can be fees for the request. Um, um, most of the time, if it's a, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, copies, pages copied, you know, they, most of the time they, they uh, waive those fees. If you have to go in and if you, if the quick check is building, uh, a, a large quick, new quick check down at the end of the block, and there's 58 full size two by three foot uh, planning sheets that show drainage and and lighting and landscaping and all of that sort of thing. There's going to be costs involved. Usually, it's like eight or nine dollars a sheet, uh, and that's you know um, sometimes you could go in and take just take pictures. I've done that before. But that, of course, you don't have the detail, uh, as much detail as you might want if you want to uh, raise con concerns and that sort of thing by taking a picture of a big sheet. Sometimes you have to, to pay the price. There are waivers, uh, waiver opportunities. You can ask the clerk or the person at the OPRA that, to waive those fees. And there's a process. And, and it has been done where they'll waive the fees if if you're for a non working for a nonprofit or for other reasons, it could be waived. Great. And last question before we go back to Aubrey here is, you know, what is the normal turnaround time? And is there sometimes a maximum turnaround time? Well, they they have there. There's a. There, it's very late. It's laid out in the Oprah and, and and the FOIA and the FOIA request too. Like I said, with Oprah, it's a seven day period. If you submit one, uh, as soon as they accept it, that it's a completed FOIA application or uh, request, you have seven business days. And you and what I do is I just mark it on my calendar and. Um, and most of the time, most of the time, especially with DEP and some of the larger municipalities, it's pretty quick because they have staff there that does those sorts of, you know, that's one of their primary responsibilities. Um, but if if they don't follow, if they don't respond in time, you can follow up with an email or a phone call. Or I always like to use have something in writing so you can verify because there is an appeals process if they're not following through as they should. Um, ideally, that's not what you want to do because then that starts a whole nother. You're fighting, you know, whether you got an Oprah fulfilled or not, and not getting the information mm -hmm. you're looking for. So, great, thank you so much, Fred and Lorraine. We're going to go back to Aubrey here, and while she gets her, um, you know, Fred, turn off your screen sharing. Aubrey, your tune is on, and while doing that, the other question we got most common is. You know, is this being recorded and, and how can we get the video afterwards? It, it is being recorded. Uh, we haven't decided on what the best way to share it is, but with, whether it's a Facebook link or a Dropbox link or we'll put it on YouTube, everyone that registered tonight will get a, a shareable link that you can um, review this, share it with your members of your community and friends and family to review the information. So thank you all for coming tonight and back to Aubrey. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Lorraine. That was very informative. Uh, so now we dealt with how to get the information that we need regarding our community and our concerns. So right after that, 
the next step would be to take action and uh, community organize, right? What we're gonna learn in this presentation is just a foundational, um, or, you know, just building our foundation on grassroots organizing, petition and letter writing, uh, effective public speaking, canvassing and lobbying, and then the three minute speech. So why grassroots organizing? We believe in the power of the people to take collective action on their own behalf. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And if you noticed his, his celebratory day that just passed on the 17th, uh, celebrating his birthday, we don't look at it as just a day off. Many of us, we are proactive in being involved in our communities. Um, so that just really speaks to um, why grassroots organizing and being involved in our community is very important because with your voice and action, it helps to effectuate change. It makes democracy work by engaging um, ordinances and people in a bottom up campaign strategy. I'm just gonna, move. in ordinary um, people in a bottom up campaign strategy, my apologies. And it works to increase the capacity of social justice movement by creating new volunteers, activists, leaders, and organizations. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And our basic elements of organizing is if people don't know that you exist, then you don't. Nobody will get involved unless the issue resonates. So it has to be turned into a personal reason and then into an act, into a cause for action. Um, I just got off the phone this afternoon with a group of people that were, that I was looking to involve with the upstream, downstream um, social injustices with the Trenton area. And their main concern at this point was dealing with the crisis of the pandemic. So while this is important, it's not at the top of their list. And so we have to understand when the timing is right for the people um, that we're trying to get to, to build on and, and to build up this foundational, um, this foundation with. We need to meet or take action for the reason. And our leadership comes in many forms. It consists of many people. Um, I learned uh, from the late great D. Bilal Beasley who was Essex County's um, freeholder we are now known as, they're now known as commissioners now, and he was also a council person. And he said, leadership was everyone in the community. Everyone had a responsibility to make a difference and make a change in their community. So he, he didn't just go speak to his counterparts. He went and he taught us how to speak to our local people in the street, our residents. What are they saying? What are their concerns? How, how are they able to uh, form groups of, of people to make a difference and to make a change. So don't think that it's just, you know, the, politi the politicians and the ones that are sitting in the municipal offices. We have leadership in our communities as well. Um, and we can't just take on the action and do it all, our, all on our own. So you may have somebody to come in and do the research portion for you and help you out with that. And then you be the one to talk to the person or to help write the letters. It, it, you know, it takes a village to, to help make a difference. And you have to fight for what you really want and not what you think you can get. You have to aim high and then you just might get it, right? So you're not looking at the little steps, not just the little steps along the way, you have to look at the big picture. What's the vision of, you know, your concern, what, how do you wanna solve this? What is the vision? And then go for it from there. And then you have to celebrate your victories along the way, large and small. Um, 
Sometimes you might be the only one cheerleading the cause. <laughs> sometimes it might take a little longer for people to join in. Um, sometimes it doesn't resonate well with folks um, and they're not as passionate about it until you're able to present it in a way that it helps to, to spark their passion and their um, imagination to wanna join in um, to fight with the cause and have fun. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in organizing that we're not, we don't see the joy in it. You're meeting new people. You're discovering different talents and skills of yourself. Many of us did, did, have not known how to go about and get the information that um, they were trying to get for their communities. And then they discovered um, trainings and, and different, um, different can, making different connections uh, with people and they're learning along the way. So enjoy this moment and have fun. Um, this is just the beginning. So when you're looking at designing your campaign, you, one, you have your issue, you pick your issue, you know why, that's why you went and you did the research, you went and got your OPA request, uh, you went and uh, dug around your community, you might've done some canvassing, so you know what's going on. You have to set short and long-term goals. You can't accomplish everything in one bite. This is something that it, you have to continue to build upon it, right? So you, you get your issue and your base building going on. And then you have to know who your friends and foes are. So I don't like to think of our competition as our foes, right? But we want to understand where everyone sits at the table. What, do they have the same passion that I have? Do they have the same interests that I have? Can they be a um, someone that will help push the agenda along or will their agenda get in the way of it? And then that's how you build. You weigh these options out and they may not be fitted for this particular cause, right? But because they may have other information and other connections, they may help somewhere down the line. So we don't want to consider them foes. We just want to know where everyone sits at the table, where everyone stands. Um, identify your target people. Who's the person that you go to that, that understands what the community needs maybe better than you? And who has influence with the decision makers? Who can you go to speak to? Who's closer to the commissioners or the council people? Um, and who are the gatekeepers in your community? Those are the people that you want to look into and get a different insight from them to see how you can navigate the terrain and, and, and just really connect with people on a larger scale. You need to have timelines and tactics or activities. Um, when you, like, for example, if you're doing a political campaign, you know, I've, I've worked on a few of them. We would get together, we would have team building sessions. We would try to encourage one another because it becomes a, it becomes a very daunting task to have to constantly meet people and speak to people. And it's like, you're constantly doing um, engaging individuals. So you know, you want to have these timelines and these tactics, but you also want to, like we said before, have fun with doing this. Um, what are some activities that you can incorporate to keep the morale of your, uh, your individuals that are supporting you um, and are fighting for the same cause on task? Um, you have to find computers, talent, money, and people with power, right? So when we look at the message and the materials, we want to make sure that we develop a clear and concise message for your campaign and stick to it. There has to be some consistency with the message because people will get confused. But I would suggest also that when you're sticking with the message, that you are able to articulate it in different ways for the different groups that you're going to be meeting because not everyone is going to understand the message the same way. There are different audiences that you have to present before. And so you wanna make sure that you are relevant to, uh, to the cause, right? And relevant to the, and have the relevant information, but you also wanna make sure that you're speaking to where people could understand you and that they're not 
feeling overwhelmed with the mission. Because some people may not ever get it, but they just want to help and support. And so you got to meet people where they're at. Um, create materials for multiple purposes, right? So the slogan, it has to fit on a bumper sticker. Have a 30 second and a two minute explanation of the campaign, what we would might call an elevator pitch, right? Because you, you may not have that time to speak to people. It might be a one, two, three, you know, you might be in a, in a social setting and you might be in a, you know, um, a professional setting, it depends. And you have to have that quick, you know, bite to give them, to give the people so that they can, you know, take something away and think about it. And then you can, you know, reapproach them at another day. It's helpful if you have a one page fact sheet. What are the facts that we're dealing with with the cause? And then a petition and a letter that can go out to the officials and the media maybe a press release for the media, but also um, have the letter and the petition to the officials to show, I'm not the only one that feels this way. This is a group of people that feel this way. And please, you know, take the time to read this. When they see that people are more, more people are involved in the cause, they have a tendency of taking a deeper interest in, in looking at what it is that um, you're presenting to them and what the cause is, they may have, they may already know about it or they may over or may have overlooked it. It depends. So, you know, you want to be able to have that, that in and out, that just something to plant a little seed so that when you leave, they're thinking about that little 30 second, that little two minute conversation that you had with the people. Now, I'm a writer. So, Writing a letter is always, for me, very effective. Um, when you create a petition to articulate your concerns and call for action, it draws people to want to um, take this seriously. You can, this is something that you can circulate at gatherings and canvassing in the neighborhoods. Um, politicians do this, right? So you see that they have their, their information, their quick little fact sheet, their little talking points um, or on their little um, door knockers and then they go out and then they canvas the areas. And then they also um, have meetings to talk about the concerns and listening sessions, right? But these are a lot of times generated because people have created position, uh, petitions and they have articulated their concerns in writing. And it drew, it caused people to notice what it was that they're, that they're, you know, that we're fighting for. Um, you can use a petition to generate and demonstrate broader support for your concerns at public meetings and or before decision makers. So that just all goes back to um, having it there in black and white and people seeing and, and better resonating with what the cause is. And then they can take that information and they could do their own research um, and decide whether or not they're going to support the cause. So this anatomy of petition was created by our state director and our environmental justice director, uh, Amy Goldsmith and Kim Gaddy, because they were working in the, with the South Ward Environmental Alliance in Newark, New Jersey. I kept this because I think that is very important to, um, to see how this petition is laid out, right? So you have the logo right here. And then it says basically that you support the efforts of whatever organization that you are that you are um, concerned about helping, um, and that they are protected by, you know, in this case, cumulative impacts of multiple pollution threats, including dirty diesel. That's our support statement. And then you have the call to action. So this call to action was zero emissions. Uh, together that we call on the New Jersey governor to prioritize funds, mandate policies and use of electric trucks and goods movement in the Newark port region. And then they called on the mayor of Newark to establish a clean uh, kids clean air zones where only electric buses and trucks were allowed. They had the signers information and the contact information at the bottom. This, this petition 
is what you would go around and get everyone's signature. And this is what is being presented to the decision makers. And in the call to action, it's a clear, concise list of what it is that you want done for the cause. When we look at activating through letter writing, this can be used for a tool of engaging and involving the public in your campaign, like we said before. And it could concretely reflects broad-based public, the broad-based public. And it's, you know, the broad-based um, public support to decision makers. It's saying, here we are, this is a group of us. This is how we feel about this matter. It's handwritten, it's personalized. You can share your experience in it. And it's, it speaks to the people, to the decision makers and lets them know they feel very passionately about this. It's not just one person, it's a group of people. Let's look into this. When you're, when you're writing these letters, you have to be compelling and honest and explain why it's important. And then we notice that 10 letters can make an official take action. You wanna be able to keep track of everything because you wanna see what works and what doesn't work. Not every, um, not every uh, step will render good results, right? So it's, sometimes it's trial and error. So you wanna make sure that you're evaluating your successes. You wanna make sure that you're keeping account. Ask to be copied on the emails and the letters so you know who and when has, you know, who has taken action and when, and keep the petition counts also. You wanna measure your success. Because when the campaign is over and the experience is still fresh, you want to assess the value of the effort and the lessons learned for future, for the future um, use of this. So now we're looking at public speakers. So now you have the information, you got your OPA request, you saw what, what it was that you wanted to do, you, you have a campaign strategy now. Now, and you've written some letters, you've garnered support from your people uh, at the grassroots level. Now you've, you've brought the attention to some of these decision makers. Now they may want you to come in and speak at a meeting. So you wanna be effective in your public speaking. You wanna use appropriate and formal language because when you use appropriate and formal language, it's, people take notice and they are able to hear you clearer. Use a clear delivery of speech and motion, maintain con eye contact, have your ideas organized in a logical manner. It should contain interesting, personal, even amusing elements, statistics and real life examples. I have, uh, when I worked with the commissioners for the county, I've sat in a lot of meetings and sometimes it ended up this way and sometimes it didn't end up this way, right? So you don't, you don't want the decision makers to leave wondering what were they talking about? What was the issue? They didn't grasp it. And sometimes when you're sitting in these meetings for long hours and you've had the public come out and speak for or against or just have questions regarding their community, it can become a little daunting, right? We're all humans, we all have had long days of work, we all have to sit in these meetings and we wanna be able to articulate our cause and bring it to the attention and get in and get out and get the results. Um, so everything must be organized, go over it with the team. I suggest if you're, you know, whether if you're campaigning with the um, an upcoming politician, or you're just trying to get something simple done in your community. Have a team that will help you to talk this over, make sure that you're hitting the points, strategize on a level where it's more uh, constructive criticism so that you can go out confidently and speak before the people. Um, be able to get the point across and or persuade the listeners, right? That's important. A lot of people think, I just wanna get this information out. I want them to do what it is that we need to get done. This is important and it very well may be, 
but there's some persuasion that has to go along. It's some reciprocity. It's a little give and take. It's kind of like a little dance. You have to make sure that when you're presenting, you're compelling in the sense that people are interested. You've activated their hearing. They want to, when you activate a person's hearing, it activates their heart and they're able to um, resonate a little bit better has been my uh, findings. They resonate a little bit better with your cause. Um, you wanna have an effective use of notes, handouts, PowerPoints, and other visuals. And this is never read your speech when you're giving it. Uh, don't do like I'm doing right now, reading <laughs> the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so this is practice the speech before giving it. Um, that shows that you're prepared. So now we get to the canvassing of the neighborhood, right? And, you know, why canvass the neighborhood? Because this is grassroots. These are the people that you're fighting for. These are the people that you want to help. This is your base. So you have to be connected with your base. I know now with um, this pandemic, it really has made organizing a bit challenging because whereas you would normally go out and knock on doors and engage the residents of the area to take interest in what it is that you're trying to do. A lot of people don't wanna leave their homes. A lot of people don't wanna open up their doors. Um, and a lot of people have a lot of other heavy weighing things on their mind. So um, it, it's been a challenge, right? But if you keep with the foundation of, um, and, and being, being kind of creative and inventive, instead of maybe knocking on the, on the doors, but speaking with someone that has influence with a group of people and then having a Zoom session. So it's, you're hitting all of the people at the same time instead of going door by door, which is what we would have normally done and what has been done for, for years. And it's very successful because it makes a, it, really draws people on a more personal level. It shows that you care. But then when you do that, you have to continue to do that, <laughs> especially with the politicians going out and um, trying to get votes, right? You wanna make sure that you stay engaged with your community because this is your base. And you wanna constantly grow and learn more about the local concerns and the varied motivations. When you do that, it, it should give you a desire to wanna find out more information. So if you're not the person to handle whatever else you may hear along the trail, the concerns of the people, but be resourceful so that you can point them in the right direction because they'll remember that too. They'll remember that the people will remember that, you know, well, they may not have had the answer, but they pointed me in the right direction and give them the information that they need so then they they can go ahead and do their own campaigning. It canvassing generates public involvement, like I said. That's how you get your letters, you know, uh, your petition signatures, your phone calls, and an event turnout. Um, I recently moved into an area and um, it was um, while it was very exciting for me, I experienced something very negative, and it would not have um, had I not known how to connect with the people, it could have been a, a, a it could have been a very uh, bad outcome, right? But because I knew how to connect with people on an interpersonal level, the neighbors were coming out in support of, and then you got to hear how they had been dealing with this issue for X amount of years, right? And so because now you've generated, you've drawn light to the situation, now you have support when you go out to the people that are the decision makers to get the help that you need, they're more uh, prone to help you out because it's not just you being, you know, the person bringing the attention to light. It's other people. Um, other people have written letters, um, made phone calls right? So this is what you want to continue to do um, when you do your canvassing, connecting with people. It mobilizes voters. 
um, and identifies new members and volunteers. Somebody along the trail may say, you know what? I have free time between the hours of four to seven. I'm really interested in this. I have nothing to do. I like to participate, right? Or I can, you know what? I may not be able to go out, but I'm really good at writing letters. Do you need help with writing letters? Do you need help with getting the petition signed? More often than not, people want to connect with other people that have a care and a concern for their environment that they live in. So you will get new members, draw new members to the cause, you'll get new volunteers. I like to be very transparent. I'm very personable. So when I speak to people, there's this feeling of creating family, right? Because we say it takes a village um, to raise a child, right? And it takes a village to make things happen, to effectuate change. People on the same um, on the same path, people working for the same cause. Well, you know what? That village needs your love too. So that reciprocity goes back and forth. And I love to create family, right? So when we're doing these Zoom sessions, when we're collaborating with partners and we're building our base, we're connecting hearts, minds, and spirits together. And it's, it's more than the cause, right? We start to relate to people because that's, we can't just be fighting for the cause, right? We have to be fighting for the people. We have to be helping the people. So when you go out and you make this connection and you identify new members, it's, it's very helpful. Um, you may even be able to raise funds, right? So real quick, the basic skills of canvassing is the eye contact. You have clipboard control, it reinforces the message. It says, I'm here to handle business. I'm doing this, right? Um, keep it short and simple, make specific asks and you'll get results. Uh, and then it says relate urgency and timelines to act now. Um, then we have, I wanna apologize for this. So when you're doing the introduction, you wanna say who you are, what organization you represent and what the current issue is and what the specific ask is. We're generating community support for our current efforts. Take a look and then hand over the petition hands over the one sheet that says all of the facts on it, right? Um, this is what we call the body of the rat. And this was actually used um, when uh, Amy and Kim did their training. Um, so we looked at the problem and the current solution. So this was the example. One in four of Newark's children have asthma, twice the national average. Newark has the second greatest cancer risk due to diesel emissions. We are home to the third largest port of the country. The cumulative impacts of multiple sources of air pollution is making us sick. And we want our city to be a healthy place for everyone. We need a solution to this health crisis and I'm sure you would agree. So now you put it out there. It's short, it's concise, it's articulated well, and now you're engaging them. I'm sure you would agree because if you read this and you don't agree, it kind of makes you not look like a nice person, right? So, you know, you put it out there, short and sweet, and then you put the solution. This is what we want to do. Our solution to address diesel population is very simple. We want, to, we want the city to create clean uh, kids' clean air zones by rerouting trucks, route, the routes away from the schools, playgrounds, and athletic fields, as well as utilize zero emission trucks and transit buses. Do you agree? So when you put the problem out there and then you give them a solution, decision makers understand that this is something that you want to have, that you want it, you want it to be taken very seriously, but you also are not just um, reciting the problem. You're giving them a well thought out solution, and but you need their support. You need their help to make this change. So you thought of the solution, but now I need your help to make this change. And I think it makes the decision um, making process a lot simpler. And then you ask them to sign the support statement. If they respond, yes, great. 
And we're going to the next council, city council meeting on the state to express our concerns and suggest the solutions. Are there others in your house who might like to sign too? And the more signatures, the better. And then that's how you start your uh, start to amass the contacts. And if they're enthusiastic, ask if they'll volunteer. And lobbying is, lobbying is pretty much the same, right? So you learn how to effectively ask for what you get and what you want. And you influence um, the policies and practices of government and private entities. And you ask, you attend public hearings or ask for one-on-one -on -one meetings. I like one-on-one -on -one meetings. It makes it more personable, right? So now when you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and then you present before the public, at least you have somebody that's part of the decision-making that's on your team with that as well. So here's some tips real quick. Again, you always have to research and know your issue. A lot of it sounds redundant, right? So, but we're still gonna, we're still gonna make sure that we say it because sometimes the smallest detail could slip. Um, prepare the one page fact sheet. Bring supporters with you. Deliver letters or petitions to officials. Bring others to the meeting with you. Organize a public event. And distribute flies to others and urge them to take action on their own. When you write the letters to the editor, you can write them for the weekly and daily newspapers. Um, you, know, you should always dress professionally and conservatively. Um, use proper titles of the person you're addressing. Uh, speak with confidence, be courteous and be persistent. And don't assume that the public official knows all about the issue. We went over that, right? So they may have, it may have not taken precedence over what it was on their agenda but we wanna make sure that we bring awareness to them so that they can go ahead and uh, help support, be able to support for it. Um, don't threaten or lecture them. Engage in a dialogue. You get so much further when you speak one-on-one -on -one with pe people and let them know that you're not trying to create problems for them. You're trying to create solutions to the problem and you need their support and then give them a reason to commit and ask them to take a specific action. If you don't know what you want and how to get to that and, and, or have an idea on how to get to that resolve, what makes you think the other person's gonna know? You have to go into this um, relationship for, you know, for all intents and purposes, you have to go into this relationship speaking truthfully, concisely, and having everything researched and thought out so that when you make this present this presentation, people take you seriously and they want to engage and it touches them in a way that that they want to show support or at least point you in the right direction if they can. And always bring back, always go back to the issue if they wander around and change the subject. Listen and clarify. Sometimes we always know how to talk and say what it is that we want, but we don't listen. When I was speaking, when I made reference to the group that I was speaking to earlier today, I had to really listen to what was being said. And that is challenging because I have a role that I am fulfilling and there are things that I need to get accomplished, right? But at the same time, this person is with the people and they are the ears and the eyes, they see it, they hear it, and now they're the mouthpiece for, these, for this group of um, people. And you have to listen carefully and understand where they're coming from. And what I got from that meeting was, not now, later, right? It's not a, the not now was not a no. And that can be discouraging, right? But it wasn't a no, so there's always hope so we can circle back around later on. And admit what you don't know and get back to them. Don't be a know-it-all where you say, oh, I know this and that, and then, and then later on you don't, you don't know. I don't know, but I can get back to you or I'll find out from someone who does know. Um, and then real quick, our three minute speech, um, who you are, what you represent, why you're there. And we're, this is all what we've been talking about in the letter in uh, the canvassing and everything, what's the remedy and summarize it. Because now you're gonna stand before the people and you're gonna talk to them. Don't I identify no more than three points or problems you seek to address, be clear and concise, 
give examples that personalize the story, provide response or remedy to main points, and recap the main points. And that is it. Um, this is my contact information. I am the Water Justice Coordinator with New Jersey Clean Water Action for Trenton and um, Mercer County vicinity. And we will be um, sending out this recording to everyone that has registered. Thank you again for your participation. And we look forward to meeting again with you at a later date for, more, for future trainings. Eric, do we have any questions? A lot of thank yous. You guys did a great job. Uh, thank you to all our panelists, Fred Stein, um, Lorraine Prince, and Aubrey Malinetto. Um, Malinetto. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you again. And um, Eric, we really want to uh, extend a tremendous thank you to you for taking the time out and serving with us on this evening. Um, it gets a little, uh, you have to be like an octopus to kind of man the, <laughs> the screen sharing and, and, the, um, and also the question is and everything. So we thank you for taking that off of our hands. Um, thank you to Amy Goldsmith for um, being online with us this evening and for everyone that participated and made sure that they um, not only register, 